Welcome, everybody. My name is Greg Christman, and uh, I'm the product manager for Advanced Compression. And I'm joined by my development counterpart, Ajit, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is uh, Ajit, and I'm the director of development here for the database product at Oracle. And um, primarily, I'm responsible for uh, the data engine and uh, specifically uh, advanced row compression. Thank you. So, um, this session is focused on advanced compression primarily around basic compression, um, OLTP table compression, and advanced row compression. So those three areas for this session. Um, feel free to ask through chat any questions you have, and we will I will direct them to the appropriate person to answer them. Uh, please remember, uh, we can't discuss any SRs, or bug reports, or licensing issues. Um, this is kind of beyond the scope of what this is meant to do. Um, all your lines are muted, so you'll have to use chat in order to uh, post any questions. So we'll give it a second or two to see if anybody has any questions. If not, um, we'll go ahead and move along with some questions that uh, we already came in, and we can address those. So if you have any questions around basic compression, um, which is a free compression uh, that Oracle provides since I think 9i, if you have any questions around OLTP table compression, which is the data compression that was part of 11G, and was hence renamed to advanced row compression in 12C. So uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions about those that you may have. If not, uh, we'll give it a couple more minutes and then we'll move on to some um, some questions that came in earlier and uh, we'll be happy to go through those. I'll have to put in my reading glasses to read them because I won't be able to read them off the page. So we'll give it a couple seconds here. Uh, there's, let's see here. Keep trying, Jesus, we'll uh, come back to that. We'll go ahead and ask some questions and I'll uh, see where we go from there. So these ones um, came in earlier. Let me go ahead and read these and I'll direct them to the right person. Um, I think one of the questions we always get, yeah, this is pretty typical, is why use why not use basic compression versus advanced compression? And I, I'll, I'll take a stab at this, Ajit, and then uh, I'll see if you guys want to join anywhere. This one, um, you know, basic compression, which is the free compression, so it's it's free, it's been in product since 9i, it's still an 18C. Um, it's designed to do data compression, uh, dedupering, and it gets you know, a pretty decent compression ratio, probably about two to four X, if, if I remember correctly. Um, the biggest difference between, well, there's a lot of big differences, but one of the major differences between that and both LTP and, and advanced row compression is the basic compression doesn't maintain the compression for uh, DML operations. So if you enable the compression and say you do your data load and it's compressed the table with basic compression and then you go through and try to do some inserts and updates, you know, you can do those inserts and updates. They just won't be compressed um, going forward. You'd have to pretty much rebuild the table and turn on, you know, to re recompress the table in order to get those inserts and updates compressed later on. Now this is different from advanced row compression and, and LPP table compression where we do maintain that compression going forward. So after you load the table, if you do inserts and updates uh, with advanced row compression or OLTP table compression, uh, we will maintain that compression going forward whenever you do inserts and updates. Mm -hmm. um, and also with advanced row compression, with overall with um, with advanced compression, there's a lot of other compression capabilities that are included with it. So data compression, you know, being the advanced row compression is just a portion of it. There's advanced index compression, advanced network compression. There's uh, data guard redo transport compression. But also data pump compression, there's RMAN compression. So there's a lot of things that sort of fit under the advanced compression umbrella of which OLTP table compression and advanced row compression are part of that. Um, when you use uh, basic compression, that's essentially, that's all that you're using is that. There's no, none of the other components or features um, are included as part of that. So basic compression, pretty, you know, it's ideal for uh, data warehouse situations where the data is pretty cold or not changing. Um, versus the advanced row compression um, or LTP table compression, which would be for both OLTP and, and data warehouse environments. So I think, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them in. Um, we only have a couple people on here, so feel free to jump in if you have any questions. Just type them in the chat. Um, I guess for Ajit, I'll, I'll ask you this one. And this one comes up quite a bit. Um, and again, going back to basic and sort of advanced row compression, and the, the question always, you know, do these two perform their compression pretty much in the same manner? Or I guess the, the question is, are they the same type of, type of algorithm? And um, is there, 
any, any significant differences between the two, or would you expect the compression ratio between basic compression and advanced road compression to be pretty similar, um, given the same data set? Right, so the, uh, the compression ratio is pretty similar. Um, and uh, the algorithms we use, um, we don't disclose the exact algorithms we use internally. Um, and we don't speak about the exact differences between the algorithms we use for basic compression and advanced low compression. Uh, but the, um, the ratios are, uh, are the same and the formats on disk are pretty similar to each other. Um, however, like Greg mentioned, uh, one of them compresses um, on the fly. Um, if you do DMLs, et cetera, then um, the resulting rows are compressed. And in, in the basic compression case, you would need a direct load to compress those blocks. So in one case, the compression is done in a transactionally safe manner. And in the other one, you know, we do it on the other time of direct load. Uh, now, the other thing that I should also mention is... Um, Advanced compression supports, in addition to DMLs, uh, compressing on DMLs, it supports other features. Like, for example, um, if you have advanced data optimization, which is one of our newer features, um, then you could place policies at the row level. Um, you know, you press uh, rows or blocks that have not been accessed um, for a while. Um, and we would compress them in the background. We would kind of use a different thread and not the foreground thread to compress those. So advanced, advanced compression allows you to kind of uh, go beyond um, the traditional way that we have a kind of differentiated advanced compression and basic compression. Uh, and we have added uh, additional features like uh, advanced data optimization capabilities to the advanced compression algorithms. Uh, but again, coming back to your point, the compression ratios are uh, approximately uh, the same. Um, there are uh, some differences between the compression algorithms, but uh, we don't exactly, uh, uh, you know, uh, we don't publicly disclose what those uh, small differences are between those algorithms. Okay, that sounds good. On the screen, you can see um, for people listening in, is this actually came out of our documentation. Um, there is a good uh, little summary of the data compression types in our documentation. And I'll point out, we're not really talking about hybrid call motor today, but we will in the future. Uh, but the two there are kind of interesting. It points out the basic table compression and the advanced row compression and um, sort of just basic, you know, what are they good for and uh, what type of applications. And again, just pointing out sort of what we've been talking about a little bit is uh, basic table compression is really designed for DSS type apps, uh, whereas advanced row compression or OLTP table compression is suited for either one for OLTP or, uh, or DSS type application. So, uh, this, Useful if you're ever, in, if you are looking at hybrid calmer, which we'll talk about in a future uh, session. Uh, this is a good chart, just kind of discussing the different types of compression for data, and um, and what what type of applications they're good for. So uh, let's see here. So the next question that came in was, and I guess I'll take this one. Um, do I have to compress all the table partitions in my database? So this is this is pretty much the universal question we get from almost every customer that we ever talk to. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times that um, this has come up in discussion. And I'll tell you, that, to be perfectly honest, the, the answer to this question has varied over the last couple of years. We've actually kind of changed our tune a bit. And I'll tell you why we did that. Um, a few years ago, um, if you would ask me this question, you know, just four or five years ago, customers asked this question, we would have said, well, you know, go ahead and just compress your largest tables or partitions. Um, you might as well get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of the storage. And so go pick the largest table you have, draw a line somewhere that says, you know, that's, you know you're not going to compress anything after that, and, and just, just use that as your, as your sort of guideline going forward. And, you know, a lot of customers did that. They would go through and they they pick the largest tables, and they wouldn't press the smallest tables because they really just thought, and, and we we're equally guilty to this, is that we really just thought the, the true value was that um, in terms of storage savings and the small tables wouldn't give you, it would be huge in terms of storage savings. There would be some, but, you know, it's not the not the type of storage savings you're going to see for the larger tables, um, you know, that kind of dramatic storage savings. So, but over time, the more and more we talked to our customers, the more and more we realized that the storage savings are just one aspect of it. And there really was a performance aspect to it, too. And even the smallest tables, uh, even though they may not, you know, may, it may not be huge storage savings in your small tables, but there are advantages in terms of the compression because the compression reduces the number of blocks needed. Uh, that means less I.O. moving the blocks around. You know, tables there have 
just you know getting smaller, maybe they'll become memory resident in the data buffers. Um, so there are performance benefits even for the small tables to be compressed. Uh, again, your storage savings may not be phenomenal. You may not you know you compress that hundred gigabyte table and go, wow, that was you know I'm not going to buy storage for the next ten years. But you may look at it and go, hmm, you know, there's there's half the number of blocks now I need for that storage. Um, that's less I.O. for me. Uh, that's less in terms of our man backup, in terms of the number of blocks being backed up. Um, there's also, uh, you know, that, data table, that small table may now become memory resident for me. So there are performance benefits even for the small tables and partitions that years ago we strictly focused on the storage savings and really didn't think about what the performance um, benefits could be even from compressing the smallest tables partition. So uh, for the most part, we now recommend going ahead and compressing everything. Again, it's up to you as the, as the end user. If you want to compress everything, you can do that. If you only want to compress your largest tables, you can do that too. If you want to compress over time, meaning that you want to compress maybe start with your largest tables first, and then going forward, you compress the smaller ones later, you can do that. Um, one of the misconceptions often is the customers believe that they have to compress everything at one time. You know, one weekend, we're going to compress everything because you know, that's the way it should be. Well, that's not necessarily the case. There's obviously benefits from compressing everything, but if you don't do it you know, in, over one weekend, you can do it over the course of a couple weeks or a couple of months. You know, start with the largest tables, and uh, then over time compress the smaller ones and the smaller ones, et cetera, et cetera. So don't feel that everything has to be done in one shot. Um, you don't have to compress everything in one shot. Um, you could actually spread this out over time. So again, starting with probably the largest ones to get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of the storage savings. And then over time, you know, compress even the small ones. So there are benefits for that. So again, our story's changed. Um, we do recommend typically compressing everything. Uh, but again, that's totally up to you. Uh, that choice is up to you. If you look at our customers, the ones I talk to, um, it's about 50-50. Um, some of them will compress everything. Um, they'll just go turn on uh, compression for every table they have, partition, and then that's it. And again, some of them will stop at a certain point. They'll compress the larger ones and not the smaller ones. So again, it's a, a total decision on your part, but um, we do have customers who sort of do both. Hey, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear Oh, you. yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay, um, I would like to add something to the, the question you just answered. Oh, certainly. Okay, yeah. Very good. Uh, um, it's uh, based on the customer workload, uh, we can differentiate certain scenarios where we we might want to compress all the tables. Generally mm -hmm. speaking, that, that's uh, our recommendation. But uh, if there are some uh, highly, very highly con co concurrent systems, probably they should first uh, compress and analyze the performance and the benefits, and then uh, then decide if, if they need to compress further or or, or a step back in, into that uh, initial decision, right? Oh, yep, very good. Uh, thank you, Jesus. That's a, that's a great point. And if, you know, one thing we've seen our customers do, and let's see what you guys think about this, is that if they know they have tables that are, uh, are going to be very active, they're going to load the tables, the tables can be very active for, the, say, a month that's partition, and they know there's going to be a lot of inserts and updates, um, some customers will actually defer the compression for, until that activity starts to cool down a little bit. Um, would you think that's a uh, that's not a bad way of doing this as well? Maybe defer compression if you know the table is really going to be super active for the first month. Um, well, you know, um, I would say that it's not only about the table being active, but uh, okay. the number of transactions involved touching a small amount of data. Um, so let's say we have I don't know like uh, in order of hundreds or thousands of transactions touching almost the same. Uh, portion of data, uh, probably there, there will be a benefit uh, while not using compression. But that, that's something that must be analyzed per, per, per case, so, so, okay. so to make a better decision, right? Yeah, I okay. think the, uh, one of the classic uh, uh, examples where we say maybe, you know, maybe it falls into the case that Jesus is talking about are, are uh, tables that customers use as queues. So, yep. Uh, yep. you know, there are these uh, FIFO kind of uh, tables. You uh, insert a bunch of rows in them and then you dequeue the rows from the table. And so the table has constantly kind of changing data. And, um, and the data changes, uh, there's a lot of change in the data in the table. And so, and so the tables that are used as queues 
are typically very small tables. Um, so, you know, the table might have like 100 rows or 1,000 rows or whatever. Uh, but then we constantly uh, kind of insert rows for, into this table and constantly delete rows from this table. Um, so, um, right. such small tables uh, might not be the best candidates for compression. But again, we recommend that the customers kind of, just for convenience purposes, turn on compression at the table space level, um, you know, and if if some of the small tables are hotspots, then they can selectively go on, go go in and turn off compression on those particular tables. Okay, that's good advice. Very good. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, this uh, interesting for you guys have to say about this next one. It, it comes up quite a bit. Uh, we've we've had an answer for this for a number of years, but I want to see if it, maybe it's if it's different at all, or maybe um, we should be saying something else. Um, the question is, what is the overhead associated in general with advanced row compression? In the, pretty much traditionally, we've, we've always said about 3 to 5% CPU is typically uh, what we see in terms of overhead with advanced compression. I was wondering, do you guys think that's a, does that sound about right to you, or do you think it's a, in the range, or any thoughts about that one? Um, I would say that uh, th there are two, two things that must be analyzed. One is... Uh, uh, the scan path or when we are doing queries, uh, I would say we will have a performance improvements as you mentioned earlier, right, right. Greg? Right. But, uh, yep, yep. In the DML uh, side of, of, of things, uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, normally it's to, from 3 to 5 percent as you, as, as you okay. already mentioned and, and people can find in the, in the white paper that, that is published out there. Okay, that's fair. Thanks, Jesus. Um, now I can answer this one. This, uh, do I need to change my application to use compression? Um, there's no application changes required, whether you're using commercial off-the-shelf stuff or using custom design or custom build or homegrown or whatever you want to call it. Um, there's no change to your application in order to use our compression. And that's true for uh, basic compression, um, advanced road compression, and, and even hybrid polymer compression. So. Um, that is good. No, I, I'll take this one too. Who's our typical advanced compression customer? I'll tell you, it's it's about anybody you can think of, and more uh, about any industry you can think of. Um, it's a pretty fairly widely used um, comp uh, option among the uh, Oracle options. Um, anybody you can think of: finance, government, education, healthcare, banking, utilities, insurance, retail, manufacturing. Um, the list, uh, you know, and, and around the globe. So it's it's. Your customers are always worried that they're first one using a capability. Well, this capability has been around quite a long time. It's pretty widely used, and it's pretty widely used across most uh, uh, most industries. So, again, uh, any any industry you can think of is pretty much uh, there's there's more than one customer using in that industry. So, um, if you take a look, uh, if you actually go to oracle.com, if you go to the uh, customer references section, you type in advanced compression you'll see a, a large number of advanced compression customer references out there. Um, let's see here, what's another one here? Um, oh, after I enable compression, is there any other administration work that needs to be done to maintain compression? Um, I'll, take, I'll take the first whack at this and I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, I would say no, that once you turn it on, there's really, you know, assuming nothing odd happens, um, it should be pretty much self-maintaining and, and self-managing I mean, self for the most part. I don't know of any additional uh, management capabilities or management requirements once it's enabled. Uh, would you guys uh, agree to that as well? Well, uh, it depends, I suppose, um, on whether you're using uh, advanced compression or basic compression. So with basic- uh, That's true, yeah. That's true. You know, with basic compression, uh, you know, once you load, load your table and get your initial compression, those compressed, and then further DMLs are kind of slowly going to expand the rows. Um, so, uh, you know, you do DML on these compressed rows and they're going to slowly expand out. So you might lose compression ratio as you uh, do more and more DMLs on this initially compressed data. And then to get back to your compression ratio, you would have to reorganize the table by doing an alter table move um, and so on. Uh, but uh, of course, this problem doesn't exist with uh, advanced row compression and it's completely automatic. There's Really, no management required, and like Greg pointed out, it's basically takes care it takes care of stuff on its own, and recompresses the right. data as the DMLs come in. So, I don't know if Jesus has anything more to add. No, 
No, no. Besides uh, special uh, DBA requirements uh, for specific, very specific things, fine tuning. So. All right. Good. And before we move on, next question also open up. Um, if if anybody listening in has any suggestions or thoughts about uh, future enhancements you'd like to see to advanced compression, um, feel free to put those into the text, the group chat as well. We're always interested in hear what thoughts you may have and. Uh, how we can improve advanced compression going forward. So we look forward to those, those suggestions as well. Um, okay, the next one I'll, I'll throw over to my development counterparts. Um, the question that this comes up quite a bit is, um, can you provide an overview of how and when update compression occurs with advanced road compression? So I guess <clears throat> you know, the question that always comes up is, if I'm going to, when I do my update, you know, does the data get compressed right then? Is there a delay in terms of when the data gets compressed? Um, and how does that work? So I, I guess without too deep of a dive, um, if you guys, either one of you kind of give an idea or overview of, you know, sort of what happens during an update, uh, and maybe during an insert as well, and whether things get compressed right then or, or are they delayed later on, or, or how, we, how we approach that operation, the email operation. Jesus, do you want to take a stab at it? Yeah, so uh, to get the question right again, uh, so for DMLs, uh, we have uh, basically uh, three kinds of uh, operations, right, in, in general terms, uh, insert, uh, update, and delete, right? Mm -hmm. So for inserts, uh, when we insert a bunch of, of rows on, on a certain level, we are going to recompress uh, the affected uh, blocks. So that's uh, uh, very transparent to, to, the, to the user. The insert workload uh, just uh, keeps compressing and moving forward. For the delete part, uh, there is really no, no compression uh, at all until, uh, until new data is inserted in, into the table or, or into the segment. And for updates, which is a special case, which is a, a delete and an insert, uh, we have uh, some some more advanced uh, specialized algorithm to to handle these cases, which is uh, publicly known as partial compression, where we take uh, a compressed block and modify the block to just append or insert the, the modified portion uh, based on the on the update requirements. So. I don't know if that answers uh, the, the, the question. Okay. So when, <clears throat> I guess the, the, the question that seems to come up is that whenever somebody does, whenever you do an update, is it, do we always recompress at that time or could there be some updates done and, and then recompressed at a later time depending on whatever, whatever, however we determine when compression gets occurred. So I guess customers always, they always, the question, I guess the, the thought is, you know, every time they change something, is it compressed at that at that exact moment, or is there could there there be a delay where it gets compressed later? Okay, so um, compression is based on OLTP compression. Just to clarify, not basic compression is based on some thresholds that we manage in the in the in the block, right? So okay. we always we will always try to recompress when we reach these uh, thresholds. Otherwise, it makes no sense to, to recompress the data. So when we say, hey, this block is uh, full, we, we compress it. Now, if we delay, delete some rows and update some content, we will recompress the block again if we find that the block is full again. Otherwise, it makes no sense because we can still fill more data in, into the block. Okay. okay. I, think that's, I, I think that was the gist of what the question was, is that there, it's not always, it, it shouldn't always be expected that we can, we we compress each and every time they touch the block. I guess does that sound? I, I just want to add a little bit to whatever you guys said. Um, so, you know, one of the points is that we do um, have thresholds, like Jesus mentioned, in the block, and every insert doesn't go around recompressing the block. Only when we uh, insert a bunch of rows into the block, and when we hit the threshold, do we recompress the block. And this also helps us amortize the compression. Mm -hmm. over a whole bunch of rows. Now this happens in the foreground thread, okay? So this compression happens in the thread that is inserting the rows into the block. Um, there is, uh, you know, another feature that we have, um, which is a more recent feature, 
which is known as advanced data optimization, where we can push the compression to a background thread. So the mm -hmm. user basically places a policy on uh, the table on the table or the partition or the table space and depending on how frequently the block is accessed the user can set whatever business you know rules um to uh, you know in order to uh, compress <clears throat> the block, but they can define their custom logic and we would compress the block when when that custom logic is satisfied um, now we do have certain pre preset templates and rules that the user can use but um, Anyway, in when a when a policy is placed, when such a policy is placed on a table partition or table space, then the compression happens in a background thread. So the foreground thread can go on inserting rows, and we never compress in the foreground. We only compress this in a background process or a background thread. So that's one of the big advantages of using advanced data optimization together with compression. It's really beneficial. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> if anybody's interested in ADO advanced automatic data optimization. If you go to OTN and you go to the automatic, you go to the product section, and you look for automatic data optimization, there's a white paper that talks about um, how you set the policies and all that kind of interesting stuff. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you haven't done so already. Um, this question I'll, I'll point back to you guys again. Uh, it's kind of related, I guess, somewhat related. Um, the question always comes up, for customers, is that um, if they not even un may even uncompressed table as well. Should they be looking at the percent free to change that value so they reserve space um, so they don't get any road chaining going on, that type of thing? And, and, and so I guess um, if you expect to do a lot of updates, does percent free play a role that they should be concerned about or at least interested in? They should take a look at. Um, yeah, percent free is something that they should definitely look at if they are planning to update their rows quite a bit. And that's the reason percent free exists is that you know there is headroom in the block to grow. Now with compression, what happens is that we fit a lot more rows into the block. So a block that used to fit, you know, a hundred rows, let's say, now fits 200 rows or 300 rows or 400 rows. And uh, if you're going to update all these rows in the block, then there needs to be room for expansion. Otherwise you are going to get row chaining because we don't maintain the indexes when you don't update. So um, yes, so person free is something that the customer should definitely be cognizant about. And uh, potentially, in case they're using advanced compression. Now we, we, we say that the default PCT free for non-compressed tables is about 10%, uh, but, the, but you could increase the uh, PCT free on a block um, if you're having compressed blocks. Because just okay. because we fit a lot more rows into the same block that we used to fit before. But I don't know, Jesus, okay. you wanna add something to this? Yeah, I would say that, uh, uh, for customers, just try to follow the same logic that uh, that you follow for non-compressed blocks. Mm -hmm. So it should be quite similar. Uh, when you expect chaining and when you don't expect uh, row chaining is uh, more or less the, the same rules for OLTP compression or advanced row compression. Okay, that's, that's good advice. Actually, that uh, question comes up quite a bit, so that's I think that's uh, very useful advice. Um, Next question, I think we have just a couple more here. Um, I'll take this one. Does advanced row compression work with Oracle and encryption? And the answer is yes, they do. They work very well together. Um, you want to use the table space encryption, not the column encryption. If you use the table space, we will compress before they encrypt, so you get the best compression possible, um, and then get your encryption. If you use column encryption, they will encrypt, then we compress, and then the, uh, it affects the compression ratio. So again, but we have uh, no, quite a number of customers who use both together. Um, they work very well together. Just remember, if we're gonna use both together, to use the table space encryption, uh, not the column encryption. Um, let's see. Um, no, I think this the next one here um, is a very good question. In fact, it comes up quite a bit. Um, I'll, I'll put it to you guys again. So um, when customers are enabling compression, um, usually they use an online redef or an alter table move online or some of that sort. Um, the question always comes up, is there any advantages to, in terms of the compression ratio of compressing online versus offline, or would you expect the same compression ratio regardless of sort of the methodology, whether it's a 
uh, alter table move um, or an alter table move online or an online redef or whatever it is, um, would you expect the same, uh, essentially the same compression ratio, all things being equal, whether you're doing online or offline uh, compression? Okay, so uh, if the user is using uh, advanced row compression, uh, uh, basically it shouldn't be worrying about uh, doing an alter table move online or, or such kind of operations for, for, for OLTP-based uh, compression. But in the case that uh, it, it is using basic compression, uh, then mm. th there should there should not be any no noticeable uh, difference between between those two, unless there there's some like uh, workload specific uh, uh, like cumulative data that gets a small benefit from from basic compression, but it should be a small a small gap uh, between okay. the two when compared in certain scenarios. Okay, that's fair. And I, and, you know, I've worked with this product for years, and I, I honestly can't remember anybody ever tell me that they saw a difference in the compression ratio depending how they how they uh, how they how they actually you know, enabled the compression. So that's a good thing. Uh, let's see. Um, two more. Actually, one more question than one other thing here. Um, this one, I'll, I'll take this one. What's the typical compression ratio for basic advanced uh, compression? Um, for basic compression, advanced compression, we typically see about two to four x compression uh, ratios. Um, just a just as a side note, um, customers who use hybrid Calmer compression, um, usually the range there is about six x to fifteen x. So, but two x to four x is pretty typical of our customers. Um, you know, I've done this for a long time, and and I've seen a lot of uh, compression advisors. You know, we have a free tool called Compression Advisor, uh, DBMS underscore Compression. You can run for free point it to any table or partition, it'll tell you the compression ratio estimated. And actually does a fairly good job at the estimation. Uh, it's pretty darn accurate. Um, but in most cases, um, majority of our customers usually fall in about the two to four X compression ratio range. Um, sometimes, especially with um, some of the packaged apps like uh, SAP and uh, eBusiness Suite, I've seen in the six X range for advanced compression, um, sometimes a little higher, I don't know why, but um, just the nature of the data, I guess. Um, so, but two to four X is pretty typical. Uh, two X would be about a 50% reduction. So, uh, your footprint. So again, um, not bad um, with compression ratios. Um, one other question I have here is, uh, can you suggest any useful MOS, MOS, MOS notes? And actually, when I saw this question, I came, I found a slide I had from earlier days that talks about some useful MOS notes that deal with uh, compression. So. I'll leave this on the screen for a little bit, and there yeah, might be some things here. There's a good number of MOS notes here, some of which are pretty useful. Uh, advanced compression master note, uh, how a compressed table that's online, uh, advanced compression critical patches, um, redo transport compression with the data guard we really didn't talk about, but it is a feature of advanced compression. Um, how to see if rows are compressed in a table, a complete understanding of RMAN compression, which we'll probably talk about in a future uh, session. Uh, how to determine if advanced compression is used by data pump, uh, in, index organized tables and compression, it, and the how to use the free index compression that's part of uh, 9i, 11g, and 12c, and 18c um, as well. So there's a whole number of things here um, that sort of out, most of these are outside the scope of today's session, but uh, we'll probably cover in a future session as well. So anyway, um, I have that's the list of questions I received. So. You guys, I uh, think we're doing pretty good on time. Any other things you'd like to say, Jeet or uh, Jesus? Or uh, we don't have any questions on the chat. So any other any other observations or anything else you'd like to say? If not, um, I think uh, we can call it a day, pretty much. Um, I don't think I have anything to add, uh, uh, Greg. But uh, I think uh, you know um, we've had extremely uh, good feedback about compression in general from customers, um, and um, I think uh, you know. Advanced compression is one of our most heavily used features for the Oracle, you yep. know, as the Oracle database, as an Oracle database option, it's one of the most heavily used features from you know, by customers. And uh, yep. overall, um, I think customers are extremely happy with it. And uh, we look forward to your feedback on what we can do to improve the feature even more. Um, so yep. we're always looking for feedback from customers. So it'd be helpful if you can uh, drop us a line, if you can contact Greg uh, or one of us. Um, and tell us what you need, um, what you would like to see in the future. Yep. 
That'd be great. Hey, Tooth, anything else to add? Uh, no, not, nothing else. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you, Greg, for the invitation. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So just to go on to what Ajit said, um, you know, advanced compression has been around quite a while. I think it's almost a decade now, if I remember correctly, somewhere around there. It's a very stable, um, widely and heavily used capability. Um, so if you haven't used it, I encourage you to take a look at it. A good way to get started is with the compression advisor. It's uh, if you search for DBMS underscore compression in the manuals, it'll tell you how to use it, and it'll give you some ideas about your compression ratios. If you're in 12C, it'll give you ideas about your data compression, your index compression, and your log compression ratios. As Ajit said, if you have any suggestions on if you're using this already, have you had some thoughts about how we can improve it, uh, make it easier, make it uh, better, make it whatever you want to call it, um, feel free to reach out to me through the dev gym, uh, through ask, ask Tom and ask me questions, or you can contact me directly at uh, greg.chrisman at oracle.com and give us any suggestions you have. If you happen to be in open world, stop by my presentation. We'll happy to talk to you about any suggestions you have there or take any other questions. We'll be doing this again next month. Um, we haven't determined the topic yet, but we'll be posting the topic and uh, we'll go through additional questions or any questions anybody has. So again, I thank you, uh, Jeet and Jesus. Thanks, we'll see you guys next month, and uh, we'll be posting this on uh, Ask Tom, so anybody can review it if they have any. Uh, if they want to go back to the uh, question and answer session. So thank you guys, and uh, you. we'll see you in a month. Bye. 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 Bye.